Alrighty, our last talk of the day is profiling with Dale. So how's everyone doing? Everyone still awake? Yeah, yeah, cool, all right. All right, we're almost there. We're actually ahead of schedule, so just bear with me. All right, so profiling. First of all, who's this guy on stage? I don't know. Um, yeah, so I've been, uh, been here for close to 11 years, not as long as Francis. I think he's the only one in observability with more tenure than me, but I'm still fairly ancient in Shopify terms. Um, yeah, I work on the uh, pipeline that enables um, application profiles to make their way into Observe. Um, given that we're primarily a Ruby shop, uh, we have a vested interest in uh, profiling working well for Ruby apps. Um, and yeah, profiling is kind of one of the lesser known signals in observability. Um, some people forgot to mention it as a pillar, but that's okay, I'll forgive you. Um, but yeah, before diving into all the details, I'm actually gonna take a bit of a step back and kind of use this uh, as an opportunity to sort of build up what the heck profiling is sort of from first principles. So what is profiling? Seems like a good place to start, right? I like to use the analogy of profiling as kind of like uh, a stop motion video. So in this analogy, the profiler, you can think of it kind of like a camera. Um, and yeah, a profiler, it's a thing that, surprise, collects profiles. Um, some runtimes will you know, have built-in support for this. Shout out to Go, awesome profiler. Um, others you know, will rely on third-party libraries. Um, and there's also such a thing as like, out-of-process profilers. So these are dedicated profiling tools that are used to, to profile you know, another process. So I see the profile as kind of like the stop-motion video that we sort of stitch together from the individual um, images that we capture. And the ultimate goal of profiling anything is really to kind of gain a better understanding of uh, some, some kind of resource usage. Um, so this might be like execution time, uh, time on the CPU, object allocations, memory usage, et cetera. And so we want to be able to kind of to track that back to uh, what is actually using that resource, what, what particular path of code and even what function is, is doing it. So now, uh, what's a profile? So simply put, profile is a collection of samples. Um, so if you think of each sample as a still image, then the profile is really the overall kind of stop motion video of what's going on uh, within the app. So a profile could have some metadata associated with it. This could be some you know, uh, global values like you know, the time when the, the profiling session started, the total profiling duration, et cetera. And there could also be some metadata that, uh, that applies to every sample within the profile. All right, so what's a sample? Um, I've mentioned the term a couple times, so let's take a closer look. So referring back to the uh, stop motion uh, video analogy, uh, the sample is basically our still image. So it's one kind of individual uh, frame in, in the video. So typically a sample will have three main components. So there's gonna be um, a stack, so this is the thing that we're charging the resource usage to. Uh, a weight, so that's the actual amount of uh, resource usage. So this could be, um, you know, we, we often think of, of profiles in terms of, of time, but this could also be uh, bytes, um, allocated objects, et cetera. So it's, it's a fairly abstract concept, the weight. Um, and there can actually be some, some sample level metadata, but this can actually be fairly expensive to uh, collect and makes it a bit more expensive to, to query further down, uh, but can be very useful in some cases. Um, and yeah, ultimately, the purpose of a sample is a mapping of, uh, of resource usage. So we've got a stack, that's the resource user, and the weight, and that's the amount of resources that it used. All right, so I just mentioned a stack. What the heck is that? Well, I hope the computer scientists in the room know what a stack is. Um, but just in case, let's review it anyways. So stacks are very important data structure in computer science. Uh, they let us build these really cool things called Turing machines, but I'm not gonna get into that theory, don't worry. Um, and basically, you can think of it as a list that's got a push and a pop operation, uh, or it's kind of analogous if you think of like a stack of cards. You can put a, a card on top of the stack, you can take that card off, but you can't be just jamming cards anywhere you want, pulling them out. Um, and so in this analogy, uh, an individual card in the deck is what we call a stack frame and a stack frame represents one function call. So per this figure here, 
we've got our stack, it's got our main function, we just started our program, that uh, main calls func1, and that pushes func1 onto the stack. So, if we want to look at how a profiler actually works, we need to go into, you know, how do we take these snapshots? How's this camera working? How's it taking a snapshot of the stack? So, unfortunately, we don't usually have um, uh, an easy way to just ask the stack, give us all your frames. Um, so like on an x86 computer, uh, the calling convention will dictate, you know, we, uh, we save our return address, push our function arguments, and then update the instruction pointer uh, to the function that we're calling. There's no easy operation to say, okay, what, what functions were, were actually called. Um, it's just incidental, right? So the way that we um, do this is a process called stack unwinding or stack walking. And essentially we have to rely on the compiler to give us all this type information. Um, we know the, the arguments that a function accepts, uh, the size of those arguments. And with that information, we can kind of build a map of the stack and use that to navigate from one frame to the other. So yeah, it's the process of unwinding a stack. Um, it's a fairly intensive, complex process. Uh, so we can simplify it using something called frame pointers. And these are basically kind of like breadcrumbs. So every time we do a stack call, we push this extra uh, bit of data that lets us just easily navigate and, and collect the stack. So if you're ever compiling something from source, please, for the love of God, add frame pointers. It makes the job a lot easier. But this is kind of just a, a, an example that I plucked out of, you know, out of the blue. Um, it's a fairly common approach to, you know, how you might unwind a stack, but it really depends on, you know, what runtime you're working with. Um, for instance, the way this is done in Ruby is actually totally different. I'll eventually get to Ruby, don't worry. Um, yeah, often language runtimes will provide a convenience function to do a lot of this heavy lifting for us. All right, so how do we actually query uh, profiles? So I've defined a bunch of the background now, get into some of the more fun stuff. So running an app at scale, um, you're probably going to want to have some way to combine uh, the profiles from multiple processes uh, through something called aggregation. So this gives us uh, more insight than looking at an individual profile. Um, so when you aggregate profiles, for instance, it's possible that if you were just looking at an individual one, you would see something that's, you know, just 1% of the request or something. It doesn't seem that expensive overall. But then you combine you know, hundreds or thousands of requests, and it's very prevalent. So that's one of the superpowers of aggregation. You can see uh, this type of optimization opportunity um, that you, know, you wouldn't have been able to find otherwise. Um, and yeah, so basically we, we send a query to our back end, in this case Pyroscope, uh, and the back end will aggregate the profiles together. So here's kind of an example of what that looks like uh, in Observe. So we're, we're taking a look at uh, request profiles of the Shopify core monolith over five minutes. Um, and if you look at the uh, frame table on the left there, so that's the top uh, stack frames that, um, you know, where we're spending our time, it's kind of interesting to see that uh, one is marking, number two is class new, and number three is sweeping. So we're spending most of our time creating garbage and then cleaning it up. And this is one of the things, you know, you might see that in an individual profile, but through profile aggregation, it makes it very, very clear that this is what's going on. So how does this aggregation process actually work? So it's actually fairly conceptually simple. Um, we can treat the, the stack trace and the label as a sort of composite key. And if a, two samples have the same stack trace and the same label set, we can simply add their weight. You can also think of them as sort of like hashing to the same bucket. Um, so in the example I've got on the screen here, we've got two samples. They've got the same stack we can see. They've got the same labels. One of them has a weight of six. The other one has a weight of 20. We can combine them to have a sample with a weight of 26. Fairly trivial example, um, but this is what's going on under the hood when you're using a system like Pyroscope to uh, query across you know, thousands of samples. All right, so 10 minutes in, let's talk about Ruby. So um, 
There are a few profilers available for Ruby. Um, I'll talk briefly about the three major ones. It's not an exhaustive list. There's lots of other profilers. Um, you can build your own if you want. It's not that hard. Um, to make it good is hard. Uh, but ultimately, these are just kind of data sources that we can use to, to query and aggregate on. All right, so the first one here uh, is RBSpy. It's a great uh, profiler um, that we actually started out using for uh, continuous profiling at Shopify. Um, it's an example of one of those out of process profilers. So this is actually observing another uh, process. And then one of the neat things about it is the other process doesn't even have to instrument anything at all. Um, so you can actually just go and spy on any arbitrary Ruby process and I don't think it's that rude. Um, so it uses a clever mechanism called the Linux uh, ptrace API. Essentially, it will pause the target program briefly um, and then implement its own method of stack walking uh, by navigating this stuff called Ruby control frames, which I won't get into. Essentially, fairly analogous to what I showed earlier, though. Um, and yeah, that's how it takes an ind individual snapshot. Uh, it will unpause the program, let it keep running, and this kind of runs on a timer, and that's how it sort of takes uh, it's a little stop motion video of what's going on. Um, so this sampler is limited to what's called wall clock profiling only. Um, so I'll talk about some other types later. Um, and unfortunately, we actually don't use this uh, at all anymore, but the uh, official Pyroscope Ruby SDK is using this under the hood. Um, the next profiler is Stackprof. So this has kind of been like, it's held the throne for being the de facto Ruby profiler for years and years and years. Um, if you look at the implementation, it's actually fairly simple. Uh, there's a few different profile types, but they all kind of work on the same principle. Some kind of uh, a signal is fired, and then under the hood, it uses an internal uh, Ruby VM function called RB profile frames. Uh, I love this because it does all the hard work of walking the stack, so we don't have to do any of that. Um, and yeah, it gives us kind of the highest amount of detail about each of the frames as, as possible because it's a Ruby VM itself. So it gives us all the class and module information, potentially even you know, like the path to the file on disk, et cetera. Um, and it never actually pauses execution, but it tends to run the collection inside of a, uh, a trap handler um, or a Ruby trace point. Um, but it's all happening within the Ruby process itself. So there's three modes that it uh, offers. Um, CPU mode will give you uh, a view of what the Ruby proce process is doing while it's on CPU. It can be a bit deceptive though, uh, as if you have a ton of threads, it can be fairly easy to, to misattribute it. Um, the other mode uh, that's quite popular is wall clock mode. So this is like real time or time as humans experience it as opposed to a CPU. And yeah, this this is you know it's a bit better. Definitely, uh, I would recommend this mode if you're if you're you know if, if it's your first time using Stackprof, um, and it will only snapshot the stack that initiated the the profiling session, so it can potentially mask work happening in other threads. And finally, it's got um, object uh, mode, which I don't know. It's kind of even a bit of a misnomer to call it profiling, because um, under the hood, it's using Ruby's uh, trace point API. Um, and just kind of taking a snapshot after every nth uh, object allocation. And as we saw from the earlier slide, Ruby is very, very hungry when it comes to uh, allocating objects. So this can be, this is definitely hands down the most expensive mode, um, but can still be very useful for gaining insights into where those allocations are happening and you know, potentially tell developers where they can optimize their code to you know, uh, reduce the amount of garbage. As they say, the best GC strategy is don't allocate in the first place. And really quickly, this is just, a, you might have seen this type of visual, visualization before. This is a speed scope. It's a popular viewer for, for Stackprof. At Shopify, this is definitely the main one we use. Okay, and finally, we have Vernier, which is kind of like the new kid on the block. So it's the newest major Ruby profiler. It's still under development. Uh, by the brilliant J uh, John Hawthorne of GitHub. Uh, he recently gave a great talk about it. Um, he'll explain it much better than me. You should check it out. Um, some of the innovations of it, though, um, are that it outputs in this uh, different JSON format that's compatible with uh, the popular Firefox profiler 
UI for, for viewing profiles. Um, and it can record these things called markers, um, which indicate if a particular condition was present or not when, when a sample was taken. So this gives developers a whack of a, a bunch of new insights, um, such as you know, like which thread was holding the Ruby uh, gro global VM lock, uh, or what impact uh, garbage collection is having. Um, it only offers two modes. Um, it offers wall mode like Sackprof, but it's, I would argue it's much better than Sackprof, as it records all threads, um, and yeah, like it, it gives you an insight into uh, where GC is happening. And it gives a, a retained mode, which it's probably closer to execution tracing than, than profiling, but we'll still call it a profile. Um, and it's, it's a new but very expensive type of profile to collect, but it's very useful if you want to see over the span of a request, um, what memory was allocated and then retained. So here's a view of a Vernier profile in uh, Firefox Profiler. There's a lot going on, um, but basically at the top, those rows indicate the different threads of the Ruby program. Um, and you kind of got one track per thread, so you can toggle between the tracks to see what the individual threads were up to. And the timeline also shows which thread uh, was holding the, the GVL and you know, when, when garbage collection events are happening. So that's the marker table on the bottom, the, the blue rows. All right, so the astute observer will notice that Shopify didn't write any of these profiles. So uh, what is it we actually do here again? Okay, so uh, first off, um, one of the challenges uh, with profiling Ruby is that, uh, for the most part, the, uh, the formats of the output are not directly, directly ingestible by uh, Pyroscope. So uh, Google's uh, PProf format is kind of the de facto standard for, for profiling data. Um, actually, the previous talk they were talking about open telemetry and all that fun. Uh, but uh, there's a PProf extended format that I think has been officially accepted by OTEL. So, but it's, it, you know, based on, based on PProf. Um, and ultimately, so we want, we want PProf in order to be able to, you know, put it into the back end. Keeping with the theme of not wanting to have our instrumentation, um, you know, add overhead to the application. We want to have, you know, the least amount of work being done in process as possible. So this conversion process of going from Stackprof or, or Vernier to PProf, we don't want to be running that um, in user space. So the, the basic contract we have is we'll run the profiler and then just try to get that profile out of there as quickly as possible. Um, so we, we put it into a, a low priority uh, background thread uh, to, to upload um, to our converter uh, when the app has hopefully you know, got nothing else better to do. Um, and yeah, so ultimately it'll get picked up by uh, a Rust application that will take the, the input JSON format, uh, convert it to PProf, and then upload it into Pyroscope. And just a quick aside, we actually had originally written that in Go, um, but writing it in Rust was actually 10 times faster. Uh, but ironically, we lost our ability to profile it in doing that. <laughs> All right, and this is just kind of a simplified view of uh, what that pipeline looks like. So we've got the apps, uh, they shoot their profiles over to the processor, goes into Grafana Pyroscope, and then the happy devs uh, view it and observe and make their apps faster. And as Francis said, it's very addictive. Okay, another challenge that's kind of unique to Ruby is that um, Ruby stacks are very deep. So um, Ruby, really encourages developers to write lots of small, simple methods. Um, anyone who's ever used RuboCop has probably seen, you know, cyclomatic complexity too high, make your stuff simpler. Um, but the result of this is that you have very, very deep call stacks. Um, it also results in more uh, unique call stacks. So when we remember the aggregation process earlier, we can only combine two, sta two uh, samples if the stacks are identical. So we're less likely to get a hit the longer the, the call chains are. So when we aggregate Ruby profiles, we end up having really, really high call chain cardinality. Um, 
And it's unfortunate because ultimately there's a lot of stacks that are like really, really similar, but maybe they differ by like one frame and like, sorry, can't combine them. Um, so that makes the query uh, part of this a bit more expensive. And it also makes it really hard for the browser to render. So we've seen like WebGL just like completely shut the bed trying to uh, render this. And yeah, so beyond just Ruby, uh, if you go and throw Rails and GraphQL into the mix, you can get some really fun, deep stacks. So we've regularly seen stacks that are five, six, uh, 700 frames deep. Um, StackProf actually has a max buffer size of 2048 frames, and we have seen apps exceed that. Um, that usually only happens though if you have some kind of recursion going on, hopefully. Um, but by contrast, what I would call you know, a more well-behaved runtime, uh, Golang, you might see stacks that are you know, 20, 30, 40 frames deep. So just to illustrate that, here's a Go, and yeah, we've already scrolled to the bottom. That was so fast, I'm actually gonna play it again. Oh wait, no, sorry, here's Ruby. <laughs> Almost there. And there we go, cool. All right. So, um, yeah, so one of the last sort of things um, with, we've kind of learned with uh, profiling Ruby at scale is we actually only need like a small subset of the data. So if you have a large app, it's, sorry, a small app, it's fine to just sort of profile every instance, probably fine to profile every request. But when the app gets larger, this doesn't really make much sense anymore. So our two largest traffic apps, that's the, the Shopify core monolith and our storefront renderer, they handle like huge amounts of traffic. So profiling every request um, would result in yeah, more data than we can handle. Um, querying this data would be basically impossible. There'd just be too many samples to, to aggregate. Um, and this would also just add overhead to, to every request as you know, running this sampler, briefly pausing and, and taking those snapshots, um, add some overhead. And that would just be contrary to the, you know, the goal of profiling, um, helping developers to improve their performance. And ultimately, there would actually be like no real benefit to this um, because we can rely on uh, sampling a small but statistically representative number of requests. Um, so in statistics, this is known as the principle of uh, law of large numbers. I like to call it the principle of good enough. Um, and basically, uh, profiling, already, it already involves sampling to begin with. Like We're not tracing execution, we're taking these snapshots. Um, so we're just applying another level of sampling above this. So we actually have a, um, a middleware that we very recently open source um, to uh, the repo here, Shopify slash app profiler. And so it will, uh, whenever a request comes in, it'll decide one, should we uh, profile this request at all? And two, what type of profile should we run for this? So yeah, um, what are the benefits that we've observed with profiling. Um, so here are some examples of some wins uh, in uh, some common open source uh, libraries. Um, this is just one of the awesome benefits that you get from aggregating profiles. You can find um, you know, an optimization opportunity in one gem dependency or whatever, uh, fix that, upstream it, and then everyone else using that gem gets the benefit. Um, there's of course you know more wins than uh, than we can list here um, in you know private repos, uh, but these are just some of the examples that um, developers who have used the profiling tooling have come to us with, and that's it. Um, I think I have a little bit of time for questions if anyone has them. <laughs> who was that? Perfect. You were talking about markers earlier. Um, what kind of data can you attach to a marker and is it available now? Yeah, so you can think of a marker a little bit like, um, it's like a key value pair but the only value is true. Um, so you can say uh, like this thread is holding the GVL. Um, and it's actually not applied directly to the sample, it applies to like a range of samples. So it's a lot more efficient than if you were to say store that value directly on the sample. Um, yeah, but it's arbitrarily like any sort of condition you wanna say is present on the sample, you can, you can indicate that. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> Just wanted to share that with you. Um, may, I, honestly, like a question for this whole group. Um, raise your hand if you've used profiling on any of your processes. So all the hands. Oh, up, every single one. So happy. Thank you. Um, anybody want to share a particular insight or win they got from profiling? Because we've all done it. Philip does so bad. Um, yeah, like a typical performance killer can be just logging a bunch of stuff. Um, so yeah, we've often had to <laughs> like uh, re reduce the amount of stuff that we log so that we can um, improve performance of our apps. Yeah. Where do I start? Um, so at, in the talk we gave, um, the service discovery that was profiled um, to figure out that prom agents were using 50% you know, of their memory doing service discovery. Um, that was one. I think Philip and I both went to town on Thanos receivers for query performance and found bottleneck there that ended up saving, I think it reduced latency across all of queries by some ridiculous percentage. Um, like I want to alert on profiles. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's like a really common request, but I personally don't understand it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know how to do it either, but yeah. No, there we go, yeah. So is it feasible to modify the profiling libraries to change the output format to something we can use rather than doing that dynamically? Um, it, it, on a case-by-case -case basis, maybe. Uh, the way, like the most efficient way to do it is like incrementally build it up as you take each sample. Um, but for, for instance, like StackProf, that would involve like completely rewriting StackProf. Like it's got its own efficient way of, of building this stuff up um, with like some Ruby internal dictionaries. Um, that is a good question. Um, but yeah, I think just in general, like I think it might be a little easier for, for Vernier as it's already kind of in the last step converting it to uh, the, the Firefox Gecko format. But we'd have to take a look at that. Good question, though. Um, can you talk a bit about how you do request profiling? Uh, I think that Sorry, how we do what profiling? Re request profiling. So I know the the pprof uh, format allows for attaching arbitrary labels to profiles. Do you do something similar in Ruby as well? Yeah. So um, we're using we're currently using for for continuous profiling um, stackprof. Hopefully, we'll be on Vernier soon, um, but. Uh, Stackprof has a concept of just overall metadata for for the full profile. Um, it doesn't have any concept of, of sample level um, metadata. But essentially, the way that uh, that the request profiling works is the uh, if you're familiar with Ruby middlewares, um, you get the rack environment and then you do whatever you want with it and then do uh, you know rack dot call um, and then that returns and bubbles up through you know probably about hundred middlewares. Um, but that gives us a chance to basically, before we do rack.call, we uh, start the profiler. After we do rack.call, we, we end the profiler. Um, and so we can, co we can collect the metadata uh, that's available before starting, and sometimes the metadata is only available you know, after the request is, is processed. But um, yeah, essentially, we'll, we'll take the metadata that we collected, uh, jam it into stackprof, and then that gets shipped along, and actually, it is converted into into pprof labels in, in some cases. Did I answer your, your question, though? Yeah. Hey, right, cool. Glad to see all the interest in profiling. <laughs> <laughs>